three. So what are the what's what are the preference laws for? What are they supposed to solve? So you provide goods or services to a company, uh, they pay, no problems. Two years later, you get sued by a trustee. Uh, what the heck is this? How could how could this possibly happen? They they want to take back the money, but they want to keep my product or service. So. What are these crazy laws about? What is the problem that the preference laws try to solve? The easiest way I found to describe it is to see is to see it as a party. So this is a special party. Some people, this is obviously a metaphor. Some people get to this party early, and uh, and there's a pie. On it. So let's say four people show up to the party early, and they start taking divide the pie in four four slices and uh, they start taking slices um, but, but what if there are a lot more people coming to this party and you know a hundred people show up later uh, and they're going to be upset because there's there's no pie left or there's very little pie left and the people who get there first got, got unf un unfairly large slices so the host may say those that got there early and got big slices should give should give the slices back, so the pie can be distributed equally. Um, and the host obviously is a metaphor for a trustee. The party is the beginning of a bankruptcy case. And what the preference laws are about is that some some creditors get paid right before bankruptcy. Well, we're going to say in the ninety day preference window, and a lot of creditors don't get paid. And then when there's a bankruptcy, all the other creditors that didn't get paid are going to get very, very small slices. And uh, the, in theory, it's unfair that some creditors uh, got, got paid early, so to speak, and got uh, unusually large, got paid in full, they got large slices. So, you know, in the, in the party example, um, there are a number of questions that arise. Is it fair that everybody should return the slices? What if someone knew that, you know, other people were going to show up and they wanted to get a big slice before anybody came? Uh, what if there's no pie left at all? So there are all kinds of questions that, that come up. What if someone didn't know at all and just, and just, and just, and, and just took a slice and ate it, uh, but didn't have any clue that there were going to be uh, other people coming to the party. So wh what do we do with all these, with all these issues? So that in a very, very simplistic nutshell is what the preference laws are about. Uh, the question is, uh, should some people be exempted? In theory, if you got paid while well, the debtor was insolvent, and I won't go into a lot of the details for our purposes now, um, you were preferred. Debtor didn't have enough money to pay everybody. You got paid right before a bankruptcy case. Other creditors, after the bankruptcy case is filed, are going to get paid much, much less. Uh, they're not going to get, obviously, full payment because the trustee is going to divide up the assets of the debtor equitably. And so they'll all get a very, very small piece, whereas you got a big piece, even though the debtor could not pay everyone equally when he, when he paid you. So did you get preferred? Yes. Are there defenses to it? Yes. Um, and, that, and I'll go into those in a second. But that's, that's basically what a preference clawback is. What's interesting is that it's not, preference is not defined in the, in the bankruptcy code. Um, it only says, uh, what the trustee may avoid and what the trustee may not may not avoid. So this is 547B. This is a list of um, uh, trans. This is a list of criteria for certain trans transfers that the trustee may avoid. And this is a sort of a laundry list of what he needs to prove to avoid uh, to take back money that was paid during that uh, 90 day period, assuming you you were not an insider. This is uh, a list of, uh, 547C is a list of transfers that the trustee may not avoid uh, that meet certain criteria. And this, this list um, uh, goes on to cover uh, the safe harbors or defenses to a preference case. So what is a preference if it's not defined? My own personal definition, and you're not going to find this anywhere, uh, and don't rely on this, 
It's any full payment to a creditor when the debtor is insolvent uh, and a bankruptcy follows. Um, that's sort of my simple way of understanding. Uh, if you get full payment uh, by a company, but, but the company's not insolvent, could pay everyone, it's not a preference, could pay everyone. And that's, that's one of the elements that, ha that has to be part of the plaintiff's uh, um, uh, issues that the plaintiff needs to prove. Because if the, debtor is, if the debtor is solvent and the debtor can pay everyone, then it, it's fair to everyone that you were paid 100 cents on the dollar. Also, it's got to be followed by, uh, your payment has, has got to be followed by a, a bankruptcy. Why? Because the debtor can be insolvent and then three months from now be solvent. So it's not just a matter of getting paid when the debtor is solvent, it's the fact that there was a bankruptcy after that. I'm going to go a little bit into the rationales for the preference clawback laws, just so you get a little bit of a better understanding. First one, equality of distribution during insolvency. So that's obvious. Debtor doesn't have enough money to pay everybody, so it's not fair for some, some folks to get big slices that's basically being taken out of a pie that should be divided more, more fairly. Discourage creditors from being aggressive. So creditor knows the company's in trouble, wants to go in and, and, and get paid um, before other people uh, get paid or, or before bankruptcy. So the preference laws in theory discourage that kind of aggression because if you rush in and, and get paid, you're going to get sued by a trust anyway. So theoretically that discourages that kind of behavior. Preference period, uh, we're done with the rationales for now. The preference period, uh, is something you need to know about. It's a very basic to a preference case. And that's it. Very easy, start of the preference period 90 days prior, unless you're an insider, in which case it's a year. Um, and uh, that's all you need to know. So why is it called a preference? Because someone's preferred, very easy. Okay, very quickly I'm gonna go into the defenses. Contemporaneous exchange defense. This is a simultaneous or near simultaneous exchange for cash for goods. And the theory is that uh, a debt wasn't created. So in other words, you sell bananas to the debtor on Wednesday before the bankruptcy, he pays on Wednesday. There's no, there's no credit transaction. The, the theory is that the bankruptcy estate is not, uh, is not uh, lessened by this, trans by this transfer. And the theory is that Payments aren't being made to pay a debt. They're, pay, they're being made a, 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 with the purpose of receiving an instant, uh, uh, reasonably equivalent benefit. Uh, in this case, the bananas. Um, also, the preference laws are designed to pr protect creditors. How are they protecting creditors? It's protecting those creditors uh, uh, that are getting very small pieces of the pie after a bankruptcy filing. So it's protecting those creditors by discouraging other creditors from getting paid in full uh, before the bankruptcy case. And why is that protection? Because in theory, uh, the creditors that are paid after the bankruptcy filing uh, will get paid more because there'll be more assets, gonna bring more money in from the people that shouldn't have been paid in full, in theory. As far as this particular defense, it has two prongs. One is intent. So both parties uh, should have intended that the transfer be uh, substantially contemporaneous and that, no, that there would be no credit transaction. Second, that the transfer be substantially contemporaneous. In other words, you, you sell the debtor bananas, but he doesn't pay for three days. Is that still come under the defense? Probably. But that's the issue. Was it substantial or not? And there are a ton of opinions on is 10 days already, uh, is that, does that take it out of substantially contemporaneous or is that, is that, uh, is it, is it fair to consider 10 days between transfer of goods and service and payment? Is that still, does that still fall under this defense? And that's what the uh, lawyers argue about. The ordinary course of business defense, if you Google preference, defense, the first thing that comes up is that. 
it's actually misleading because <laughs> it's, it, everyone says, hey, I got paid in the ordinary course, but I'm free. Um, not really. It's, it's, it's actually pretty hard to prove. But I'll go into it a little bit. Basically what it does with the classic way of showing an ordinary course defense is to compare how you got paid in the preference period to how you got paid in a uh, base period. So in other words, how you got paid a year prior. And the theory is the judge has to decide if your payments during the nine month, I'm sorry, 90 day period, three month period uh, was ordinary. So how's he going to do that? He's going to look how you always, how you always got paid. And then if this is how you always got paid, it's ordinary. It's ordinary between the parties. So he's going to look how, how you used to get paid. And if it compares uh, uh, well, then the theory is, hey, it's ordinary. Let's give you an example real quickly. So let's say uh, I always got paid in 11 days in a comparison period. And I call that the base period. Let's say a year before. I always paid 11 days clock. And then in the 90 day preference period. So let's say in the, in the preference period, the 90 day preference period, you also got paid in 11 days. So this is a good ordinary case uh, fact pattern defense for ordinary course because uh, the payments, the days outstanding are extremely similar, assuming nothing else is different in the transfers or in the course of dealing. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a good case. Of course, this never happens but this would be a very nice case, very nice defense. What typically happens is more like this. You got paid 11 days of clockwork. Of course, what typically happens is that the company's in trouble and filed for bankruptcy and its payments are gonna get later or stranger or whatever. And here you have a payment that's uh, 20 days. So is that in the ordinary course or not? Is it, does it take it out of the ordinary course? Is it, is it much later than usual? Is it, you know, the lawyers are going to argue about that, but that's an example of an issue that could arise in an ordinary course defense, and that's extremely common. Another way of showing similarity is, um, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of ways of analyzing the data. You can take the average days outstanding, how, late, how, much, how long they took to pay, that's the days outstanding. So let's say it's 11 days average in the, uh, in the um, comparison period. And let's say it's 12 days average in the preference period. So you're going to say, hey, you know, the averages are pretty close together. It's ordinary course. You can take a range of payments. Let's say you got paid between two days and 30 days in the base period. And you got paid in between 10 days and 14 days in the preference period, you're going to argue, Your Honor, we were paid within the same range, so it's ordinary. So there, there are a lot of ways of arguing ordinary course, and there are, there are also standard deviation arguments. It gets, it, get, it gets rather detailed. Collection pressure is an important aspect of ordinary course or non-ordinary course dealings. This is an example of a of an email that uh, would appear to be ordinary course, uh, it's simply a reminder that payment is overdue. Um, and the key is, were these sent the year prior to the preference period? They probably were. Is this extremely unusual? Probably not. This is more aggressive. We're not going to ship anything unless you pay us. Did this only happen during the preference period? Or did it happen a thousand times in the year prior? So what the court is going to, is the, the plaintiff is going to focus on this kind of issue if there's unusual collection pressure. And the question is, was there or was there not? And, and, and that, the, the strength of the defense is going to depend on the consistency with past behavior. There's no prior history of payment. Um, the cases say that typically we're going to look at in general, whether the, in general, the ordinariness of the transaction <coughs> and also whether the payment was pursuant to contract. The industry standard is an independent way of showing ordinary course. In other words, you don't need to show both the ordinariness between the parties and the ordinariness 
for the industry as a whole. Um, and it used to be you had to show both, but after 2005, you can show either or. The industry standard is basically what's normal for your industry. If you got paid in 90 days, is that normal? And you prove that typically uh, with an expert or uh, data, data from third parties or testimony, <coughs> excuse me, testimony by the, uh, by, by an officer or the defendant that's also maybe acceptable. How to define an industry is an issue. It tends to be an expensive defense because typically uh, you need to hire an expert to give an opinion on your industry. The other side's going to hire an expert. There's expert depositions, there's expert reports, and uh, this is uh, great for the experts, but not so good for the defendant uh, paying these bills. So it's, that's the big downside to this defense. New value defense is uh, the third defense I'm going to talk about. That's governed by this code section 547A3. Instead of explaining it, I'll just give an example, which is easier. So you get a check uh, during the preference period and then you deliver product, then you get another check. Um, let's assume this product was never paid for. What you can generally do is offset the value of product that was not paid for, that was either product or service that was not paid for and delivered or provided after the receipt of a uh, alleged preferential transfer and then it sets off that transfer. In other words, the transfer that came before the provision of the product or services. So that's that in a nutshell. It gets complicated as you can tell and we usually Use a spreadsheet to kind of figure it out. Paid new value may, in other words, if you provided service or product that may be um, available as new value, it's a compli very complicated area beyond the scope. I, I did another video on this and you can uh, watch that video. Generally, unpaid new value is, is, is what courts and defense lawyers look to. Uh, to set off against uh, prior transfers. I'm going to talk a little bit about fraudulent conveyance transfers. These are entirely different uh, than preference uh, transfers. It's another kind of clawback. Um, and uh, I'll go into the, uh, I'll go into what fraudulent conveyance is and, how, and the basic defenses of a fraudulent conveyance. So what is a fraudulent transfer? Again, this is my own definition. You're not going to find this anywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a simplistic definition, but I think it's helpful. A pre-bankruptcy transfer of property while the debtor is insolvent, can't pay everybody in full, which results in creditors getting less money later in the bankruptcy or no money uh, later in the bankruptcy. So that's how I define it. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll give you examples of it. These are the different kinds of examples. I'll go into each one quickly. Parking assets, sweetheart deals, bad deals, Ponzi schemes, and fraudulent conspiracies. All right, parking assets. So Jim owes money to, to Bob and Gary. Bob and Gary come knocking at the door. Jim takes all his assets out the back door and gives them to Mary and says, Mary, will you hold on to this until, until these guys are gone? That's called parking assets. You're taking away your assets, taking them out of your name, taking them out of your possession. You're parking them somewhere. That's a fraudulent conveyance of your assets. It's a fraudulent conveyance to Mary in this situation. And a trustee, if a trustee is appointed in this case, then the trustee is going to sue Mary and say, the assets were transferred to you for basically no consideration uh, and we need them back so we can pay creditors. So that's an example of parking. Sweetheart deals. Um, okay, so take the same example and this time Jim happens to like Mary and sells his, uh, his Porsche to Mary for $5,000 where it's worth $75,000. 
So he files for bankruptcy and he's got creditors. So it's not fair to his creditors. Why, 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 is, he favoring, why is he favoring Mary? Or, or let's say he owed Mary uh, $100,000. And, and let's say uh, he's giving her a, a Porsche worth 200000 So So why is he doing a sweetheart deal with Mary? Actually, it doesn't even matter. But the fact is he is. And it's not fair to other creditors who come knocking at the door. And then when the assets are distributed, the Porsche is gone. And instead of having 200000 which is what it's worth, they have 100000 So there's less money to divide up. And, and Mary, uh, Mary is basically being uh, unfairly um, favored. So that's like a sweetheart deal. Ponzi schemes. Well, most people know what a Ponzi scheme is. Basically, there is no business. The investment uh, by uh, Tom invests 100,000, gets back 150K, but the 50K profit came from the next so-called investor, Bill, who invested 100,000, and so on and on and on. So it's really a fake, a fake profit because the business doesn't actually generate any profit. So that's a Ponzi scheme, and that's a fraudulent. The $50,000 is a fraudulent conveyance uh, because it's taken from new investors. It's their money. It's somebody else's money. It's stolen money. So that's considered a fraudulent conveyance. To Tom, 50,000 to Tom is considered a fraudulent conveyance. Fraudulent conspiracy. So let's say someone is selling fake antique coins and he gets a few friends uh, he gives them the coins that go ahead and sell this and I'll split the profit with you and they and, and they sell to uh, 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 To people that think the coins are real and it's basically a fraudulent it, The whole business is fraudulent. And it's a fraudulent conspiracy. There's a bankruptcy and the creditors are the people that were uh, sold the uh, the fake coins and uh, a trustee is appointed and he's going to get money back that was paid, the so-called profit that was paid to the conspirators uh, because it's stolen money. So that's an example of a fraudulent conveyance in the context of, of a fraudulent uh, enterprise. Uh, the Bankruptcy Code um, has a section on fraudulent uh, transfer 548, which controls, um, but you'll often find when these cases are filed that state law fraudulent conveyance law is also invoked and that can be done under section 544 of the bankruptcy code. This is 548. You want to know what it looks like? Statute of limitations typically two years. I'm not going to go into details. This is just a short introduction. One of the things you might want to know is that the reach back period is usually longer under state law. So in other words, bank law covers two years um, from a, two years back from the filing of a bankruptcy, but state law will often go much further back as long as eight years. Many states have adopted the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act and that provides for a four-year statute of limitations. So a lot of times trustees will sue under state law because uh, they can go back uh, further in time and recover more alleged fraudulent uh, transfers. What you should know is there are two types of fraudulent transfer claims under 548. Sometimes they're uh, combined. In other words, the trustee will allege uh, both. Five, uh, under 548, there's actual fraudulent transfer and there's constructive fraudulent transfer, and they're very, very different. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, uh, and I have other, I do have other videos on this, but under actual fraudulent transfer, uh, the trustee must prove an actual intent to delay, defraud, or hinder an actual intent. Usually, this is shown by uh, badges, what we call badges of fraud. And there's sort of a laundry list and the trustee doesn't have to show all of them. Constructive fraudulent conveyance is different. The trustee does not have to show actual intent to defraud. Um, what his focus there is on 
that the debtor received less than a reasonably equivalent value in exchange for the transfers. Um, he's also got to show that there was insolvency. So it's a different analysis and a different level of proof. Well, to a constructive fraudulent claim, the defense is reasonable equivalent value. Uh, that the debtor was not insolvent, obviously, it was a double negative, that the debtor was solvent and good faith. Okay, to wrap up the fraudulent conveyance discussion, and again, I have other videos that give a lot more detail, you're free to watch them, is jurisdiction. And um, there's been a lot of controversy about that over the last few years. Basically, the bankruptcy court does not have jurisdiction to render final rulings over fraudulent conveyance cases. However, the U.S. Supreme Court has decided that the bankruptcy court can acquire jurisdiction if the defendants knowingly and voluntarily consent. Jurisdiction is a very complicated issue. I just wanted to, just wanted to touch upon it real briefly. That basically covers um, very, very basic preference and fraudulent conveyance principles.